Welcome, thank you so much for tuning in to service. My name is Nick, this is Pastor Mingo. We've got an amazing uh, service set out for you. Before we jump in though, I wanna make sure that everyone stays with us during the service. And the easiest way for you to do that is to download the Eastlake Church app. It's super simple, download it from the app store. And on there, you will find lyrics to the songs we're mm -hmm. gonna sing today, and also notes for the message. It's gonna be a good one, so you're gonna to wanna to take notes for that. Yeah, and when you download the app, it'll actually give you access to some other features, like joining us in generosity. Uh, and uh, if you don't have the app, you can still join us in generosity by going to our church website, torypines.church. Uh, you can also text generosity to 67076. All of those will lead you to joining us in generosity. And I love when people give to the church. You realize you give through the church, and it's such a great way uh, to love our city well. Uh, people always want to know what's happening kind of up to the minute and up to the week activities here at the church. There's an easy way that you can join us that way. If you sign up for our email list by emailing us at info at torypines.church, you'll receive uh, conveniently packaged every single week events that you can either join to attend or you can volunteer. And again, the pathway there is real simple. Just email us info at torypines.church and we'll get you all the things that are happening here at the church. We've got a great service with some time of worship and some great teaching. So let's dive in. Let's go for it. For 
Jesus, there's nothing impossible. is a great shifting that has been happening in our country, in our culture, and really with the globalization of the world in our globe around the world in general over the past few decades. Uh, as I said in week number one, uh, we are living at the beginning of what is now a post-Christian culture in our country. And this is new. The predominant worldview today is no longer a Western Christian worldview. That is not to say that anybody at any time in our country, everybody was ever a Christian. It's just that the predominant worldview world that influenced oftentimes politics and policies and, and cold, greater culture in general was kind of a shared worldview that had its roots in things like one nation under God and the Ten Commandments and, 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 and you know, the golden rule. And there was a kind of this shared experience and value value in our nation. Well, we're no longer living where that is the predominant worldview. The predominant world today is a postmodern secular one. And what this series is all about is how do we as Jesus people, if you're here today and you're a Christian, you're a Jesus person, with the shifting and changes that we've all experienced, and depending on your age, some of those changes have been pretty significant over the last several decades. Things that used to not be now are. Things that weren't accepted now are. And so how do we as Jesus people live 
in a day and age like we find ourselves in today. And so this series is all about helping us navigate this moment that we're in. And what we don't need to do in this moment is be scared or be fearful. We don't need to run to corners and get dogmatic and judgmental and and angry towards the bad old world out there. And at the same time, we don't need to compromise biblical truth, water it down, remove things just to make it easier for us to fit into culture or for us to fit in with the ways of culture um, when sometimes those are in direct opposition with the ways of Jesus. What we need in this time is wisdom. We need wisdom to live a better way to represent Jesus well in our world. And that better way, we believe, is the goal of the series. What we're trying to learn together over this series that we're going through, uh, and this is week number three. If you missed any of the weeks, you can go back online and catch up. Uh, here's the goal of the series. This is, this is really what we want. We're trying to learn how to stand firm and love well in a culture of compromise. In a culture where the sidelines and the goalposts and everything kind of keeps changing, we want to learn as Jesus people, how do we stand firm and love well? Sadly, so many Christians have seen these two things as exclusive activities. That is somehow you have to choose one or the other. You either have to stand firm in your faith or you have to be shallow and water it down if you're going to love well. And the truth is, we can do both. We need to do both. Our world needs to see Jesus people that can do both. Why? Well, first of all, it's because as Christians, you you know where the name Christians comes from? It was actually a derogatory term that the culture, the world around the first disciples of Jesus gave followers of Jesus. They they called them, oh, you're just trying to be a little Christ. In other words, they acted so much like Jesus that they were being called little Christ. And that turned into the phrase Christians. Christians. And so if we're Christians, that means our lives should look like Jesus. And the reason we need to learn how to stand firm and love well in the cultural times that we live in is because Jesus would do those things. Here's what we know about Jesus. Scripture tells us that everywhere Jesus went, he went with both grace and truth. Jesus never compromised his convictions. He never bowed down to popular culture. He never gave in to temptation or peer pressure or went along with the crowd. Yet he always loved well. People who were nothing like Jesus really liked Jesus because of the way he loved. And so what the world needs to see today is not an angry, judgmental church pointing fingers at everybody who's wrong and living bad out there. But they need to see a church that looks a lot more like Jesus, full of grace and truth, able to stand firm, not compromising our beliefs or our convictions, and at the exact same time, loving really well. And these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. They can be done. And by God's grace and through the power of his Holy Spirit, we're trying to say, Lord, would you help us be people in our schools, in our places of work, in our community? that we'd be the ones who could do that. And this idea is all throughout the New Testament. Let me just start by giving you one scripture verse. This could be a memory verse for some of you this week, right? Maybe you wanna write it down on a a post-it and stick it on your computer or or write it on a note card and stick it on your mirror, you know, like, like, uh, or it's almost Halloween. Take red lipstick and write it in scary font on your mirror, I don't know. Um, But 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, Let me just show you one verse that says these two things, that here's what Christians should do. And in fact, could we read this out loud? Everybody inside, everybody outside, everybody watching at home, online, if you're in a coffee shop, just yell it out with all your might. Um, And let's create a weird experience for everybody there. Okay, here we go. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, and our outside voices, ready, begin. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. It's not one or the other, it's both and. We must stand firm and we must do it in love. And to help us learn how to do this, we've been going through the book of Daniel. We've been looking at one of my favorite people in the Bible, Daniel, who was a, and his friends. 
and how after being captured and taken as slaves out of their homeland, Judah and Israel, the, the, the uh, capital city, the holy city of God's people, ransacked Jerusalem. And now they're taken, uh, you know, 1,500 miles across two deserts back to the Babylonian Empire. And they are put in this indoctrination program to basically learn how to think and act like Babylonians so they can be sent back out on behalf of the empire to rule. And, and what we're learning is how in a foreign pagan culture, these God-fearing people were able to stand firm and love well. And today we're going to pick up the story in chapter 3. Now let me just set it up for you in case you're just joining us. When Daniel and his friends were first taken captive, they were probably teenagers. Somewhere between the ages of 13 and 17 would be the age of Daniel and his friends when you read chapter 1. And remember that story where they in, they're in the indoctrination program and he says, hey, we don't want to eat that. Like that's chapter 1. They're teenagers. Well, by the time we get to chapter 3, Pastor Mike alluded to it last week, about 20 years have passed. And Daniel and his friends, um, they have Hananiah, uh, Mishael, Azariah, those are their, those, those are their Hebrew names. Uh, they have all risen to prominence. God's favor and blessing is on their life. And Daniel at this time is number two, leading the entire empire. And his friends have risen up in prominence and influence as well. Yet, all of a sudden something happens that forces them to have to make a decision. Are they going to compromise? Or are they going to stand firm in what they believe? Are they going to do what God has asked them to do? Or are they going to follow this man, the king, who has all the power? So let's pick it up. Daniel 3. Here we go. Verses 1 through 7. King Nebuchadnezzar, that's the guy ruling that part of the world at the time through the Babylonian Empire, made a gold statue... 90 feet tall and nine feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messages to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all the officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald shouted out, People of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, um, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and other musical instruments. In other words, he got tired of writing down what they all were at this point. But I'm sure there were electric guitars and drums in there. It was awesome. Um, when all these things, instruments play, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bowed down to the ground and worshiped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now pause right there. You can read all of this on your own. We're going to read, read a lot of scripture today because it's an amazing story. But I'm gonna, we're going to skip ahead. I'm going to tell you some verses. So it says everybody bowed down, but here's the problem. Not everybody did. Daniel's three friends. Remember them? Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, now given Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Man, they, they kind of had to draw a line and go, man, I, we, we, that's just, I mean, you can do a lot of things, right? Like, like we'll be slaves, we'll work for you, like, 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 but like that's something we're not going to be able to do. And here's what you know. These were outsiders. They were, they were now Jewish kind of middle-aged men that had, had risen up in prominence and authority. And so you can imagine that Babylonian men who used to have their positions of power were a little bit jealous that how did these foreign Hebrew guys get my job? Why do they have more influence with the king than I do? And so when you read the first six chapters of Daniel, what you see is that these other guys that work for the king are always trying to pull Daniel down and pull his friends down. And that's what happened here. Because there were a couple tattletales in the group. And they went to the king and said, hey, king, you know how you told everybody to bow down? Well, yeah, everybody did, except those three Jewish boys, those friends of Daniel's. Now, you might be wondering, where's Daniel in this story? Here's a little Bible history for you. We don't know. Like, so the, 
I spent a lot of work to find that out this week, you know. Uh, no, here's, here's the truth. We don't know. Now, we do know Daniel was number two. So maybe he was with uh, the king and he was exempt from this kind of exercise to show their loyalty. Or because he was number two in the whole province, here's another theory, is that he was somewhere else when this whole thing went down. He was out in service to the king somewhere else. We don't know. But what we do know is Daniel wouldn't have bowed down because you'll have to come back next week. We'll show you there's a similar story where he finds himself in the situation of his three friends. So there were some tattletales and they come back and they were, hey, king, you know those three Hebrew guys that you like a whole lot? They didn't follow the rules. They didn't do what you said. What are you going to do about it? And so that's what they say, verse 12. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you put in charge of the province of Babylon. Babylon. You gave these guys these big positions. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship their, the gold statue that you have set up. Now, this first part of the story, this is a great example of the original cancel culture and over-government reach, okay? In other words, the government's going, here's who you're going to worship, here's how you're going to worship, here's when you're going to worship, and if you don't do it exactly the way we want, we're going to cancel you. Like, meaning your life. You're going to be thrown into a fire and we're going to kill you. Now, here's the reality for most of us. We're never going to have to face that level of decision when it comes to our faith. I pray we never will and neither will our kids. We still have a whole lot of freedoms when in this country. And I pray it never comes to the place that it does even today. There are Christians in the world today in places like Afghanistan, that just simply having a professed faith in Jesus could cost them their life. And they could be brought to a point just like these guys. We're going to give you a chance. You renounce your faith. You believe what we believe or you die. May that never happen to us. But even though that might not ever happen to us here, the enemy of our soul is still trying to do the same thing to us that he was trying to do to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego then. And that is this. Satan is always trying to get you to worship something other than God. This is always his plot. It's always his ploy. It's always his plan. Satan is trying to get you to worship something other than God. And, and the crazy thing is, Satan's not creative. He uses the same tools that he used then today. What are the tools that he used back then? Well, here's what he used. Did you catch it in the story? Image and sound, right? What did he want them to worship? An image, right? There was something to see, and then there was a sound. There was all this music. There was something to hear, a gold idol and music to bow down to. And this is why you should always be careful with what you see and what you hear, Because eventually what you see and what you hear will shape how you think and what you believe. That's why you you gotta be real careful not to just go, well, you know what, it's just music, it's no big deal. Like it's just what everybody, that's just what everybody listens to now. Or don't be so naive to think, ah, you know what, it's just a movie, it's just a TV show. Like it's just an hour-long commentary, news. Right? It's, it's no big deal. Well, it could be a big deal. Because if what you listen to and watch mocks God or opposes God's truth or promotes a way of living that is opposite of God's best for us, eventually you will follow that and not God. Because you've given your eyes and your ears to culture, not God. And sadly, this is one of the reasons many churches and Christians are being pulled apart right now. Because people in churches are being more discipled by pastors and personalities on TV than they are pastors in their church. Let me give you an example. There's a whole lot of people being pastored now by pastors like Pastor Sean Hannity. Or, you know, Pastor Tucker Carlson. Or Pastor Anderson Cooper. Or Pastor Don Lemon. Right? People are given more weight to things with letters like CNN or MSNBC or FOX than they are the B-I-B-L-E. See what I did there? Some of you are like, what does that spell? (laughs) 
And here's the problem. When we're constantly giving our eyes and our ears to someone other than God, eventually it always will shape your heart. And this is what is creating such a toxicity of division and confrontation in our country. And sadly, it's leaked into the church of Jesus Christ in our country over the last 18, 19 months as well. Churches and Christians that seem to be putting political agendas before kingdom of God agendas. Now that it's tense and awkward, let's get back to the story. Okay. Don't worry, equal opportunity offender today. If I haven't offended you yet, I will get there, okay. <laughs> Back to our story, okay? So Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they don't buy down. They get told on, and now they're standing before an angry king who says this to them. Let's pick up the story, verse 14, 15. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or worship the gold statue that I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. In other words, he's like, we're going to run through this again and you better do what I said. Because if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? Whew. You hear the pride and arrogance in that? I'm so glad we don't have governments like that today. So glad. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm talking about the last two presidents, okay? In case you were like, <gasps> like, no, the last one and this one, okay? Like, yeah, I mean, it, it's the classic, like, no, we're in charge. You're going to do what I say. You're going to do it my way. And here's what you need to know. Culture always wants to create a confrontation and make you feel like you have to bow down to their beliefs and agenda. This was the strategy in Babylon, and this is the same strategy of Satan today. Create a moment where now you feel forced. Oh my gosh, something bad's going to happen to me if I don't believe what everybody else believes. If I don't go along with what everybody else is doing. And so as we work through the rest of this story, here's what I want to do. I want to give you three ways how you can live a stand-up life in a bow-down world. In a world full of compromise. Full of like changing ethics and values and all these different things. How do we as Jesus people live a stand-up life when it seems like everyone and everything else is bowing down? And let me just give you one real quick caution as we go through this story. Let's be careful not to just overlay this story into a really narrow experience in our culture right now regarding things like vaccine and mask, okay? This story preached long before covid and the principles that God wants his people to learn from this story will be around long after COVID, okay? So let's not just overlay this story into some really narrow slice of this moment in time right now. So how do we live a stand-up life in a bow-down world? And there are things that we can apply right now with what's going on in our world. Let me give you three of them. Here we go. How to live a stand-up life in a bow-down world. The first one is this. Standing firm takes courage. Write that in there. Standing firm takes courage. When everyone in your class at school is believing one thing and you believe another, that takes courage. When everybody in your dorm or everybody in your apartment or everybody in your fraternity or sorority is doing one thing and you know God is calling you and asking you to live in a different way and do another, that takes courage. When everybody in your business is cutting corners and taking advantage of people because they can and nobody really knows, but you know God's called you to a higher level of character and integrity in the way that you do business, that takes courage. When everybody else is bowing down to a 90-foot gold statue and you're the only three standing up, that takes courage. Look at what they say when they're confronted by the king about not, not bowing down, right? So he goes, you guys got one more chance. And then he's like, do you have anything to say for yourself? Look at what they say in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. Now, pause, because at first glance, that can sound really snarky, doesn't it? You know, kind of like, you're not the boss of me. Right? Like, like that's almost like what they're saying. That's kind of what they're saying, but they were not saying it in a disrespectful way. You'll notice that in a second. Another translation says, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not worried about what you can do to us. Now, 
this is not saying they weren't fearful. They, they've served Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar for 20 years. He was a ruthless emperor, a ruthless king. They knew that if he said it, he meant it. They knew he would kill them if they didn't bow down. They knew the fire was real, right? It wasn't like they didn't have any fear. I guarantee you they had some fear. But what they were able to do is access something that was greater than their fear, and that was courage. Courage is an emotion. Courage is not a removal of fear. It's the ability to act in the presence of fear. If you've ever been a part of law enforcement or the military, you know this, you're taught this in your training. It's not that you don't have fear. It's not that the reality of the situation isn't clear. It's that you are choosing to have courage over the emotion of fear. That even though you don't know the outcome, even though you don't know what's behind that door if you have to kick it down, even though you don't know what's waiting for you when you hop off that helicopter, you stand firm, right? Courage is the ability to move through fear, to say, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not gonna go along with the crowd. I'm not giving into the pressure. I'm not giving into the fear. I'm gonna stand firm and move forward. And I think the reason these three Hebrew guys had it in such an incredible way is ultimately because the next thing, write this down if you're taking notes, standing firm takes faith. It takes faith. And faith is different than courage. Here's why. Don't miss this. Faith is not an emotion. Faith supersedes our emotions and faith tells our emotions what to do. So understand, faith is not a feeling. Faith is not some super spiritual experience I have and all of a sudden I'm like, ooh, I got it. I got faith. And I talk to people all the time that are waiting to act on faith until they get some super spiritual feeling. And here's what I found in my life, that I almost never get that super spiritual feeling. There's been a time or two where I'm like, oh man, okay, no doubt. I feel God. I sense God. I know he's, he's calling me in that direction. But most of the time, here's the reality, faith, it is not a feeling. And when I talk to people and they're like, well, you know what, I just, I just don't think I have faith to believe. What they're usually saying if I get in a conversation with them is they haven't had some, you know, God zap you spiritual experience yet. And to start following Jesus, you don't need the God zap you spiritual experience. If you get it, good on you. But what I've found is most people, here's what faith is. Faith is a decision to put your hope and your trust in someone that is bigger than you, greater than you, better than you, stronger than you, that knows more than you, and that loves you more than you could ever imagine. That's God. And so faith, it is a decision of the will. Faith is a active decision. It supersedes our emotions, and faith actually puts our emotions in check and under control. And what I believe is faith will allow you to have courage. Faith will allow you to stand firm. How do, I, how do I, why do I think this? Well, look at what these three guys said to the king. They didn't say we're not scared of you because we think you're bluffing. No, they knew he was telling the truth. Look at what they said. Look where their faith comes from. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. I love how still respectful they are. Have you caught that? Right? Like, like they didn't draw a line in the sand and then get angry and yell, tell the king how wrong he is and how right they are. They didn't do any of that. They're still the way they were in the very first chapter, right? Respectful, standing firm and loving well. We're going to talk more about that next week. This week's all about standing firm. Next week's all about loving well. But even if he doesn't, in other words, even if God doesn't deliver us from that fire, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Wow. What faith. What courage. Here's what I need you to know. Their faith was rooted in God's word. What they weren't doing is making up an imaginary line that they wouldn't cross and then slapping a faith label on it. 
and going, well, you know what? My faith doesn't let me do that. Right? No, no. This was a clear thing in God's word. Don't make the mistake. Don't make bad decisions and then just say it's faith and then it's God's fault when it doesn't work. If he did not tell you to do it, if it's not in his word, that's on you, okay? Like, if it, don't call it faith if you say, I'm going to take the life savings today, go to the casino, put it on red 27. That's not faith. That's stupidity, right? And God will probably let you learn a lesson if you do that. Right? That's not, you just can't make decisions. And phrases like, let go and let God. Like, I don't think that's in the Bible, <laughs> right? Like if I just did a, you know, hey, let me just jump off and I'm going to believe that I can walk on air right now. Like, no, I'm going to face plant right there. And some of you are going to have to help me get up, right? It's not let go. It's like, no, no, no. Now, where God clearly speaks, we need to have the faith to step out. And God had clearly spoken to these guys. Not in that moment. He had clearly spoken to them over 1,400 years earlier when he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Who were these guys? They were Hebrews. They were Jewish young men. They would have been raised from the earliest age knowing that they are a part of God's chosen people, that God's purposes and plans for the whole world are coming through them. And they would have been taught that, you know what, there's ways to live if you're a person that follows God. And God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. Anybody just want to take a wild guess what the first commandment is? Thou sh shall not, depending if you're reading it in King James, don't have any other gods before me. That's the first commandment. They would have been taught this when they were that big. And so when Nebuchadnezzar puts a 90-foot gold statue and says, this is God you worship, they were like, that's a line we can't cross, bro. You can cut our hair. You can make us wear earrings. We'll work for you. But we can't do that. That's too far. And so understand their faith was rooted in God's word. And here's all I'm challenging you to, 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 to do today. Make sure that you're not putting faith on your opinion. Make sure you're not putting faith on your feelings. Make sure you're not stamping faith on your political preference. Ooh, now we're preaching. Okay, let's... let's Again, keep going because I'm, now I'm offending some of you. All right, back to the story. All right, let's see how the king responds. So in other words, they go, dude, that's breaking the first commandment. We can't do that. Look at this. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His face became distorted with rage. He commanded that the furnace be heated how many times hotter? Seven times hotter than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men of the army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So they tied them up and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. In other words, the things that they had made them wear to be a part of them. And because the king in his anger had demanded such a hot fire in the furnace, the flames killed the soldiers as they threw the three men in. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego secretly or, or securely tied fell into the roaring flames. This is where the story gets awesome. But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, hey, hold on a second. Didn't we tie up three men and throw them in the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. But look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men, unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth looks like a what? God. Jesus shows up in the middle of the fire. Now here's what's crazy is, yes, we know Jesus walked on this earth. He was fully God and he was fully man for 33 years. Born of the Virgin Mary, taught, had disciples. Uh, beaten, crucified, took sin upon himself for you and I, died, buried, three days later rose again, seen by hundreds of his disciples, ascended, in, uh, ascended into heaven, told his disciples to go into all the world and make disciples. But we also know that Jesus always was and always is. That we believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so scripture tells us that at the beginning, Jesus was there. He was there at creation. He was there in the garden. And we don't know why this is, but once in a while, when you read the Old Testament, Jesus decided just to show up. In, in, in the theological word is a theophany. 
That in other words, God manifests himself into the physical world. And, and, and there's like 10 times in the Old Testament where Jesus does this, where God does this. There's this physical manifestation of God in the world. And this is one. And again, we don't know why. You know, we always know Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And so maybe Jesus is up there. He sees these three guys take a stand. They're standing firm in their faith. And then he looks at dad and he's like, hey, let me get in on this one. Right? Like, this will be fun. Let's see what Nebuchadnezzar does now. And he just shows up with them in the fire. It's amazing. Look at this. Then Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door of the flaming furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stepped out of the fire. Then the high officers, officials, governors, and advisors crowded around them and saw the fire had not touched them. Not a hair on their head was singed and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell like smoke. Isn't that amazing? And there's a great principle here, and I don't want you to miss it. And that is this. When you take a stand in culture, you don't have to be removed from it. You can be thrown right in the middle of it without letting it rub off on you. They didn't even smell like smoke. You see, Christians, we are called to be in the world. That is our point of location. We need to be in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, on the sports teams in our community. But we don't have to be of the world. That is the source of our information. Our source is God. Our truth is God, not culture. We can live in the world without letting the world's ways be our source. And when we do that, we stand firm in our faith. Here's the last thing it does as we close this out. Standing firm inspires others. If you and I will choose to stand firm in our faith and love well, here's what I believe. It will inspire other people to take notice of God. And if the church today would come together in unity and we would really put Jesus over everything, Jesus over politics, Jesus over any source of division, and we would go, let's be the example that shows our world how a diverse group of people from different ethnic backgrounds and cultures and socioeconomic statuses can come together and let love always be the defining thing between us and work through our differences and love through our differences and serve and bless a community. Man, I think that would inspire the world around us to say, wow, what those people have is something different than the Democrats have or the Republicans have or the Independents have or different than what everybody else has. Like th those, those Jesus people have something different. Let's look at the end of the story. Look how it changed Nebuchadnezzar. This is the end. I'm gonna invite the band to come out. They're gonna do one last song for us as we... Uh, Wrap this up. Look at these last couple of verses. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, in other words, they came out of the fire unharmed. Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Pause right there. The Bible's hilarious. This is my favorite part of the story. Because what just happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He became a believer. <laughs> he was like, I'm going to kill you. Now I believe the same thing as you. Right? He's like, dude, their, their faith inspired him. And then this is his speech. He, their God sent his angel to rescue his servants who trusted him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree in his passion for this God. This is hilarious. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn from limb to limb. <laughs> so he's saved, but he's not yet sanctified. Okay, he's got a little Jesus in him, but he still has a long way to grow. Because he's basically like, if you don't follow God, we're going to kill you. Is that now how we do this? And, you know, he doesn't quite have it right, but he's trying. In fact, we will turn their houses into heaps of rubble, too. He's like so excited about God. There is no other God who can rescue like this. And this, again, look at how chapter 3 ends. It ends the same way chapter 1 does. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to even higher positions in the province of Babylon. You see, when everybody else thought they would demo be demoted or canceled, God actually promoted them. He elevated them. God's favor was on them because they stood firm and they loved well. And I believe with all my heart, God will do the same for you and I when we take a stand for him. We might have to go through some fire first. I promise you, standing for God in our culture 
and as culture continues to move away from God, it's only going to get harder. It's not going to be easier. People are going to judge you, criticize you, say things about you that are not true. But if you stand firm and love well, I believe God will see you through. He will be with you in that fire, through that trial, as you stand for him. And he will use it to influence and impact other people for Christ the same way he used it to impact King Nebuchadnezzar as those guys stood. Here's the final question I want you to consider today. Will I stand up or will I bow down? When my moment comes, and I don't know when it is, when your moment comes and you don't know when it is, you're going to be faced with it at school. You're going to be faced with it in your friend circle. You're going to be faced with it at some point in, at your job. You're going to be faced with it somewhere where all of a sudden you're going to know when all of a sudden there's a clash between the will of God and the ways of the world. And in that moment, would you consider today and maybe just say a simple prayer with me that says, God, would you help me to have the ability to stand firm? Would you help me see it in that moment and not be swayed by the crowd, not give in to peer pressure, not just do it because everybody else in the office does. Like, God, would you help me to be able to stand firm? Because if you will, I think you'll see the favor of God on your life like you saw it on these three guys. The band's gonna play a song for us. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, the first half of the song, I just want you to stay seated, okay? It's just a couple more minutes. And uh, the song is called, There's Another in the Fire. And, and this song is inspired straight out of the story. What inspired the song is the story we just read today. That when you're in that fire, when it feels like you're the only one standing firm, you're the only one standing firm at your school, in your class, on your job, in your neighborhood, on your sports team, whatever it is, that you would know there's another one in the fire with you, that you're not alone, that God's with you, that he's for you, that he is going to see you through. And then about halfway through the song, we're gonna be invited to stand and participate. And then I'll come back and close this out. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the story that you give us in scripture that reminds us that when we have faith, when we let our faith tell our emotions what to do, that we can stand and have courage and that God, you'll be with us in that fire, in that trial, in that difficulty. And so God, I pray for friends that would be here today that might feel like they're in that moment right now, that they're at that moment where they feel like they're, they're, they're being forced to choose. God, would you give them the courage and the faith to stand strong? And God, for all of us, when that moment comes for us, would we be found faithful, we pray. And so God, would we know, as this song says, there's another in the fire, that you're not leaving us, you're not forsaking us, but you are always with us. And fill us with hope and courage today through this song and this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.
the way I won't bow to the sins of this world. Oh, hey, I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. Should I ever need a There is a grave that holds nobody And now the power lives in me There is another in the fire oh, oh, oh. There is another in the fire oh, oh, oh. There is another in the fire oh, oh, oh. There is another everyone if you can just stand to your feet with us let's worship through the rest of the song together there's no in the name there is no other name but the name that is Jesus he who was and still is and will be through it all and come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning I know I will never be Thank you so much for joining us today for our online service. I hope you felt like the Lord was with you. and I, felt you, I hope you feel like he was speaking to you. Uh, when we do ministry together, we anticipate that God is going to do something big, not just while we're together in a service like this, but all through the week as he reminds us of how good he is. Uh, if you ever want to join us in ministry, if there's anything that you ever want prayer for, you can always email us, info at torypines.church, and myself and the team would love to 
cover you. Uh, you can also join us in generosity, uh, just simply texting generosity to 67076 or just through the app, navigate your way to uh, the generosity tab there. I love you so much. I'm so thankful that we get to do church together. I'll see you next week.